Today, I'm gonna to teach you guys about source control and GitHub. Now, maybe you've never used GitHub or you've used something similar like CSV, but the core idea behind GitHub and source control is this. Let's say that two or more people are working on the same application, as is typically the case in an enterprise environment. And let's say that Alice and Bob are working on the same exact file. So Alice might make a change to the file in here, and maybe Bob makes a change to the file up here. So how can we possibly sync these changes with two, 10, or even hundreds of people all working on the same file all over the world? And how can we do that in such a way that they aren't deleting each other's stuff or overwriting each other's stuff? Well, that's where the source control comes in. So what GitHub does for you is you open up a Git project that keeps track of all the changes that you make to your files and when you want to push your changes up to GitHub. And everybody else, after you've pushed them, can sync their projects or pull them in and it'll automatically throw in your changes. And then the same thing on your machine, you can automatically pull in the changes that other people are making, and then that way everything still stays synced. Now, you could still get a merge conflict, so that would happen if you and somebody else made a change on the exact same line. So like, let's say inside of this file, example.html, Bob wants to have this grocery list say T-bone steak, and then Alice on line six wants it to be something like a ribeye steak. A merge conflict would occur, but basically all that would happen is when you guys go to pull in those changes, it's going to just tell you that there's a merge conflict. So it's going to maybe show Bob's change up here and then below it, it's going to show Alice's change. And then you guys just have to decide together whose change is actually going to make it into the file since obviously they can't both be different things on the exact same line. So maybe you guys talk that out or you send a message to one another um, or maybe you just outrank Alice and then you can override what she wants to do anyway. Her opinion doesn't matter. And then you just go ahead and manually update that file and then that way you've taken care of the merge conflict. Now, there are different ways of actually interacting with GitHub and managing those changes. There are GUI programs available for Windows, Mac, and possibly Linux as well. I haven't looked into any GUI programs for Linux, but I'm not even going to show you any of those if they do exist, because they honestly aren't as good as the command line program. And that's not even me just having a minimalist preference or some type of an elitist preference. The command line is literally easier and if you're trying to become a dev for a company then people are really going to look down on you for needing to use uh, the crutch of a GUI application and in a lot of instances like where I work for example most of the time that I have to commit changes to a file is via SSH where uh, a GUI application isn't even available. It's not even an option. So if I didn't know how to do this type of stuff, then I'd be really screwed. I wouldn't be able to actually do my job. But like I said, I'm gonna show you guys how to do this. There's only a handful of commands that you need to know anyway. So to start off, you're going to need a GitHub account. They're free to make, so go ahead and go to get, github.com and create one if you haven't already. Then to create a repository, you just click new up here and then you give your repository a name. I think, let's see, is that one available? Okay, yeah, so I have git test available. If you name it something that's already the same because you can't have the same repository name under your account, then it's gonna go ahead and give you an error there. Uh, give it a description, so GitHub example. And then mark whether or not you want it to be a public repository or a private one. 
Uh, if it's public, then that just means anybody can see this repository, so anybody can download your code and they can use it. But you still get to choose who can commit uh, changes to it. So other people can't go ahead and change it on your GitHub unless you go ahead and approve the change. Private means people can't even see it. Uh, people can't even access it or anything like that unless you give them the URL. And you also have to give them your password, although I think you can set a different password for a private repository, and then people are able to actually download it. And then you have the option to initialize this repository with a readme file, which really just serves as instructions for how to use your program, uh, also how to install it if it's kind of weird to actually go ahead and install it. So now I'm gonna go ahead and create this git test repository. And because I checked the box to initialize it with a readme, it's going to be available to download because you need to actually have a file in there to download. And it does have a file, the readme.md. And by default, GitHub just puts the name of your repository into that readme file. So once this is added, you'll now have the option to clone or download the repository. So click on that green message and then you'll see that you can go ahead and download this as a zip. So it's just going to be called uh, the name of this directory here, git test. Uh, actually, I think it's called git test master whenever you download it as a zip, uh, but that's, what you would do if you just wanted to download and then use the application. But if you actually wanted to make changes to it, like you would when you're working for somebody, then you want to copy this URL and then clone it into a directory on your command line. So let me go ahead and show you guys how to do that. So we'll come here. So this is just going to serve as an example directory. I'm gonna have another one where we're gonna pretend like it's a, um, like it's a different person somewhere else in the world working on it. So we just want to git clone and then type the full URL, the person who the repository belongs to, and then the name of the repository itself. So now it's cloned this into the directory. And if I ls now, you'll see that I have this file git test in there. So I can cd into git test list it, and then we just have the readme.md. And let's go ahead and um, delete these, and then right quit, and then let's change to Matt GitHub. So we're gonna pretend like this terminal on the right-hand side of my screen is on another computer that is I don't know, somewhere else in the world. It can be in China, another country, or maybe this is somebody that's on the moon. Whatever works for you guys to understand the example. So now uh, we're over here as Matt, and then we can also do the same, get clone, github.com, mental outlaw, get test. And we go into it, and they have the exact same file with the exact same contents on both of their computers. So right now they are in sync, but now Matt is going to add the file that he's been working on to this repository. So that's gonna be the HTML that I showed you earlier. So we want to cp, uh, what was it called? Example.html into this directory here. Okay, so now there is a difference with this um, with this directory and with this one over here. And if I do our second GitHub command, which is gonna be git status, so you can see that this one tells us we're up to date with the origin master, basically meaning that there's no difference between this directory that we have here on our computer and the directory that's up on GitHub. But if we do the same thing here on Matt's computer, there are untracked files. So it tells us that we have these untracked files and then we have to get add them. And it also lists the name of the files that we need to add. So the next thing that we have to do, and it tells you right here in the command line is we need to get add 
example.html. So now this file has been added. Now I've added this to our local repository, but if I come back over here to Kenny and I do a get status, it's still going to tell us that everything is up to date. And this is because we haven't committed and pushed the new changes to the repository that we have on GitHub. This is only something that we've changed locally on our machine. And commit often confuses people when it's used in this context. I tell people to think of committing changes to a repo in the same way that you would think of committing to the purchase of a new car. So when you go to buy a car, you get to go in it, you get to take it for a test drive, you get to adjust the seats, mirrors, radio, etc. You can do almost everything you could do with this car as if you owned it, but it isn't really yours until you commit to swiping your credit card or you commit to pulling out a fat stack of cash if you're really cool like that. So these changes that we made locally can't be seen by anybody until we commit and then push our changes. So sure enough, if we do a get status on Matt's directory over here, it's going to tell us that there are changes to be committed. So what we should do is git commit m, and the m just stands for message because you should always leave a short message when you're committing that just explains what you're doing. And this should only be a few words long. So we'll say added example.html. Don't get super wordy with something like this. Save all the gory details for comments that are actually inside of your code. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then it'll tell us here one file changed and it'll tell you the insertions. These are basically just how many lines are uh, inside of it. So now that we've committed our changes, the final step is to push them to GitHub. So get push and this might give you some errors if you haven't already uh, configured your GitHub on your local account. Um, it's going to ask you for, uh, I think it's going to ask you for just your account name. Um, and maybe it asks you for your email as well. It's going to tell you exactly what you have to do to rectify it. So all you have to do is read. I've already got things set up, so obviously it's not gonna do that on my computer. Uh, so once you have it set up, go ahead and put in your username, and then it's also gonna ask for my password. And then it's going to take a little bit of time, and then it's going to tell us that we have now pushed all of our changes uh, up to the GitHub repository. So now, if we come over to our user, Kenny over here, he still doesn't have that new file that Matt pushed up to GitHub. So if we push to get a file into GitHub, what do you think we do to get a new file that's been added to GitHub is? Well, you were too slow, so the correct answer is we need to pull. So now I'll get pull inside of Kenny's directory. And then sure enough, it tells us that it's added example.html. And then if I ls, you see that now I have example.html inside of here and inside of here. And like I said at the beginning, this works exactly the same, whether it's two people that are working on the same machines inside of like, I don't know, VMs or something like that. Or if this is one person that's working inside the United States and the other person is you know, working on the moon inside of this file, as long as he's got an internet connection, this will work in GitHub the same exact way. So this is pretty much how GitHub and source control works. Um, there are a few other commands that I'm not going to get into in this video because I just want to keep it pretty basic. But if you do git, you can see all of the different changes or all of the different git options that you can use as well. 
So for the last minute of this video, I just want to kind of give you a high level explanation, a little bit of insight into workflow and how this might work for you in an actual development environment. So at the start of my day, I would do a git pull to pull in any changes that were made from last night uh, or possibly just a few hours ago because where I work, there's people all over the world. So once I start my day, somebody over in like Australia or something might just be ending their day. And all throughout the day, I'm gonna be making changes to stuff that's on my PC. I'm gonna be adding files, um, adding and deleting code, and every so often, maybe an hour or two, I want to add, commit, and then push those changes, as well as pull in the changes that my colleagues have been making. Because imagine if, well, this would be more of a failure on management's part to divide up the work properly, but, in this scenario, imagine if I spent the last hour or two working on this website, and then when I pull in the changes, one of my colleagues has already made the exact same change or more likely a very similar change to what I've done. Both of our work cannot be used in the same place. So one of us has wasted two hours of our time, not a good thing. So I'd pull and push every couple of hours, but the most important ones is that first pull at the start of the day because you don't know if someone stayed up all night long working on stuff, doing a bunch of crazy stuff and the final push of your day because you don't want the last few hours of your work to go to waste.